Wonderful. Thank you very much. As I say, I always enjoy to hear uh, the warm conversation of uh, our guests and uh, your friends and your guests being able to get together, share one another's company, and enjoy our events as an opportunity to network and reconnect. So it's always nice to hear that. And nice to have you. And I'd like to now ask you to join me in welcoming our television and webcast viewers. Uh, we'd like to thank Rogers Television uh, for broadcasting this in the days to come, and also mediaevents.ca and VVC for live streaming today's event. Again, my name is Danny Asaf, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Canadian Club of Toronto, and once again, delighted to be your host this afternoon. For over 119 years, the Canadian Club has been ext extremely proud to provide Canadians with this closely guarded, nonpartisan, and inclusive venue for the free and open exchange of ideas on issues that impact our daily lives. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we give you access to dynamic political, business, and social figures from both abroad and, like today, from here at home. We invite you to learn more about the club and join the conversations that we start on our podium. And to learn more about our club and its events, please visit us at canadianclub.org and join a conversation via Twitter at CDNCLBTO. I would like to take a moment to express a special thanks to today's event sponsors, BDC, Cisco, RBC, and to our reception sponsor, Scotiabank. Thank you very much for your generous support. And also, once again, to thank Air Canada, our official airline sponsor of the Canadian Club of Toronto. I would also like to take a moment to recognize a group of youth and young leaders who are with us today. And I would ask these tables to please stand just so that we could recognize you. Firstly, uh, proud to be hosting the York School today. It's sponsored by Diamante Development. The York School, where are these students? There we go. And also the Civic Action Diversity Fellows, uh, sponsored by Tories LLP. Where are these guests? Wonderful. Thank you. So today, by way of very brief introduction, I just want to set the stage for today's discussion and to talk about what is at stake in terms of the topic that we're about to address and hear about today. Now I know, and Arlene will correct me a little bit later in terms of my correlations here, but just in terms of trying to think about what's at stage for Canada, what's at stake for Canada in the future economic development and job creation and wealth creation. And we will look at figures that don't really match yet, but give us a sense of where we're at. If we think of entrepreneurship, we think of working in, again, smaller type of context, not the GM and the GE uh, multinationals, and we look at the percentage of Canadian businesses that are that are in that realm, the small uh, uh, business realm. There's 98 percent of businesses are represented by small businesses. And they create, again, according to government statistics, about 78 percent of the jobs in this country between 2002 and 2012. And then what you see is that translates into about 100,000 jobs a year. So when we're looking at the future, we know that that is going to be the driver of wealth and, of course, jobs. And then you look and you say, well, what segments of the populations are driving these historic numbers? And the numbers that I've seen here are they reveal, again, not completely trans transferable, but just a sense that only 15% of these businesses are led by women. So not only when we think of the way we want to encourage our daughters to participate in the future economy, not just for their benefit, to benefit from their potential, but for all of our benefit, we can start to see what we're leaving on the table today, again, in terms of Canada's future wealth and relevance for the benefit of us all. And it's going to be imperative for us as Canadians to get this right for this next generation. 
And that's why this afternoon we're grateful to have this esteemed panel to be able to enlighten us, to tell us, to motivate us, and hopefully lead us in this new direction. So on that note, I I'd like to just briefly introduce our panel so we can get to the discussion because these folks really do not need a, a much introduction with this room, this great room, whom I'm sure you're very familiar with them. So firstly, uh, I'd like to introduce you all and then ask you to join me up here and start the conversation. Vicki Saunders, she is the founder of SheEO, which helps women leverage their talents and strengths to essentially create business. Through her program, Radical Generosity, they provide access to capital, they provide training, they provide uh, leadership and mentorship for women who want to start their own businesses. She's a serial entrepreneur, a mentor herself, and a leading advisor to the next generation of change makers. She was le recently recognized uh, by EBW as one of the most influential leaders in 2015 alongside people like Melissa, uh, Marissa Mayer, uh, Cheryl Sandberg, and Michelle Obama. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Sharon Connolly, our next panelist, who has held increasingly senior roles with the Business Development Bank of Canada, uh, the only bank uh, dedicated exclusively to entrepreneurs, and in 2010, she joined the bank as the Regional Director, Portfolio Management, and now holds the position of Vice President, Financing and Consulting GTA West. And next, I'd like to introduce Suzanne West, the president and CEO of Imaginia Energy, a Calgary-based energy firm that wants to change the world's approach to harnessing energy for the betterment of our planet, a truly an oil company, a leading oil company for the 21st century, focusing on stability and community just as much as profit, and has been very successful, again, as an entrepreneur and raising capital and promoting the uh, sustainable energy business for the 21st century uh, for the benefit of us all. And today, of course, moderating today's conversation is Arlene Dickinson. Everyone knows her as a cast member of Dragon's Den, and she is also, of course, a CEO, a CEO of Venture Communications, uh, which oversees a blue chip list of clients. And Ms. Dickinson is also the CEO of youinc.com, which serves entrepreneurs and their lifestyle, and has been named and recognized uh, uh, globally and, and, and domestically, uh, including Canada's most powerful women, top 100. Uh, she's received the Pinnacle Award for Entrepreneur Excellence and named to Chatelaine's top 100 women business owners. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to have you here today, and I welcome you in joining me up here. The podium of the Canadian Club of Toronto is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce our panel for today's discussion. Thank you for that introduction. You know, it's always, um, it's hard to moderate a panel like this because my instinct is I want to talk. <laughs> so I, I've told the panel that if I start answering my own questions, they should just look at me and say, shut up, Arlene. Um, the other thing I want to say to this room, because I, I, I feel like this is a genuine privilege to have an opportunity to address leaders of today, women that are trying to lead into the future, and women who have, frankly, trailblazed for the people that are coming up. And so it's a privilege to speak to you. Um, what I can tell you is I had a chance to talk to this panel of women that I respect enormously and said to them, okay, let's cut through the crap and let's just talk frankly. So we, what I hope you're going to hear today is some real direct answers and some genuine you know, um, answers to things that are on your minds. I had a chance to speak to the students right before the event, and I said to them, what's the one thing you'd like to know? And what's, in your, what's on your mind? And they said something really telling. They said, well, one of the things that's on our mind is that, you know, we'd like the skills to be able to lead into the future because we're not sure we're well equipped for that. And then the next thing they said, and they said is, and we're tired of having to work two to three times as hard as the guys our age in order to prove ourselves. Now these are 17, 18 year old women who are still facing that challenge of having to do so much more in order to be heard. And that's one of the things that we need to change. So I'm gonna start with a really simple question. Maybe not, but let's start with a simple question. <laughs> What's, and, and I want, uh, Jillian uh, from Scotiabank asked me, she says, are your questions on your phone? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, really? And I said, yes, it's a new age. And so, but, but now my battery's dead, so. <laughs> so it was a good idea at the time. <laughs> so I'm gonna make these up. You don't even know what I'm gonna say. Um, so here's the question. What's the single largest barrier to women's success in your mind today, and how do we overcome it? 
is there still a glass ceiling? So we'll start with you, Suzanne. Um, I think, I mean, if there was just one, it would probably be easy to solve. So I, I think it's complex, but I think one of the big ones for sure, or what I encourage you know, women that come and talk to me is <clears throat> we're not always accessing our strength, which is being you. Like every single person in this room and on this planet came to this world with something really extraordinary and special to do with gifts and talents and that we should find them. Like find that thing that you feel deeply passionate about and that you kill. Um, you excel at and it, it brings you meaning and satisfaction and to be okay and not just okay with being you but to like rock being you and don't let anybody tell you that you should do something else other than you you is the strongest place to be we have uh, it's a tragedy to me to see women I mean all people is a tragedy but in particular women that are leading lives of should I should do this, I should be that, I should not do this, I should be all these. And whether that is or isn't true is if you're leading a life of should, then you're potentially missing some of the most juiciest pieces of joyful parts of life of being you. And to be okay with, with that and, and sharing that contribution unabashed and confidently, and if people don't like that, whatever. Like, <laughs> Like, be you. It will be your strongest place to be all the time, and then to go follow that, and don't let people tell you no. So you're basically saying that our biggest challenge is ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, Vicky, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Um, I'd also, th I think the biggest challenge we're facing is not even just women, it's everyone, is mindset. And, uh, you know, three major things that uh, stick out for me. One is we are obsessed with go big or go home. If you're not big, you don't matter. And this is crazy. We have a narrative about this in the world, which I think uh, really works against us. If 98% of our economy is really small and medium-sized businesses, then why does every conversation about funding focus on venture capital these days? So I think that that piece is one. The other one is um, we're obsessed with 24-7. Like, you can't actually be successful unless you work 24-7. And I think this, uh, when you hear this over and over in the press, it, a lot of people say, oh, that can't be for me. I won't be able to run my own business because I want to do other things. And I think it's a load of BS, basically, to say that you have to work 24-7. We need to have new models and we need to share success stories of women who are doing lots of other things beside their business. Um, so those are top ones. Mindset for me. Sharon, what do you um, think? I think um, confidence and the ability to persevere are important because... Um, as women, we take it, I think, probably more personally getting no and take that as a no to us as individuals as opposed to, no, I don't like this business idea or it's not right now. Um, so being able to, to separate ourselves from the idea and, and, and think that, um, that, well, they didn't like that, we'll try something else and move on. And, and also, as part of that, the confidence to feel that you ha can access the resources that we need. So Vicky had her gala for the first five, act the first five um, ventures of the CEO last week, and I was sitting the next day, we were doing some planning, and I was sitting next to um, a woman entrepreneur who had actually, just, she's a very recent startup, but she, um, she hadn't applied to be a venture, but she had contributed to, to participate in the crowdfunding, and, and we were talking about how to get resources for women so they knew where to go if they needed things, and she said, you know, really, I just want to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody. I don't have time to, to figure out the path, and there's, there are many, many resources available to women and to everyone, but, but it's very difficult to, to navigate through what's available, so supporting one another to help build that confidence and make sure that people know where the resources are that they need to have. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, I have a, a quick story I'll share when I was on Dragon's Den, um, a guy would walk down the, you know, into the den, and he would say, hey, my name is Joe, and I've got this business, and I've been working at it for five years, full time, and it's amazing. Like, it's amazing. It, like, I, listen, I'm a million dollars in debt, and I've only got like 10,000 in sales, but it is going to be huge, okay? And when it's huge, you want to be a piece of this, and I want a million dollars for 5%, and you're stupid if you don't do it, okay? That's Joe. The girl comes in, the lady, and says, hi, my name's Sue. Um, listen, I, I, I do this part-time out of my basement because I've got three kids, 
And so I can only work between the hours like 11 and 4 in the morning because the kids are, you know, busy. And, and I know that's not good. I know it's not great because I can't do it full time. But and listen, I've only done like half a million dollars in sales my first year. And I know that's not good. But, you know, um, and I have zero debt. And I know I need debt. Like, I understand that. Um, but, but I'm hoping that you might give me $10,000 for 50% of my business. <laughs> You know, obviously hyperbole at play, but that is really what happened. Why is that? What is it? Because you guys all talked about confidence and you know, using resources, but time and time again, I saw these amazing women with such strong skills and results, yet they downplayed it. They marginalized themselves. Like nobody was telling them to marginalize them. They marginalized themselves. Why? What happens to us when we're in a high pressure situation that we can't stand up? Vicki. Uh, well, I just, first of all, the, the Dragon's Den, as an example, uh, not to totally diss it, but um, <laughs> it, it's not designed for women to do well at, right? We don't stand up on stage and boast and say, hello, queen of the universe, I got it all figured out. I, I have the business model that's going to disrupt the universe. Like, we don't say that. We stand up and we say, here's what I practically achieved. Here's what I'm going to be able to do later this year. Uh, and here's what I'm going to be able to do next year. And everyone goes, eh. Not, not a big enough return, right? We want, everyone's chasing the unicorn out there, looking for the next big multi-billion dollar thing, even though it rarely happens. And so I think that a lot of the processes that are set up for us to, to walk into were not designed by women or for women. And I think this is one of the things we need to change. We need to create an environment where uh, women can thrive. And so it's, you know, if, if half of the population isn't deeply engaging well, in something that's set up, we need to change the process, not change the women. That's interesting, and I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> so that's interesting, but I'm guessing Suzanne's got a different point of view. How much money have you raised, Suzanne? Uh, over my life, or yeah, mm, two hundred and fifty million dollars. She's know. raised two hundred. <laughs> wait, so there's two hundred and fifty million. <laughs> Uh, but $250 million, um, and yet you, so you were in these situations where, you know, it wasn't set up for you, but yet you were able to succeed. So why? why what's the difference between what Vicky's just said and what you experienced? Um, probably, um, you know, two or three things. One is no is, does not mean no to me. So, uh, super important tip uh, that... <laughs> No just means I haven't found the right way to say it, or no means I haven't found the right, it just, it does not mean no to me, and I don't take it personally, I don't, I literally, it just doesn't mean no to me. Um, it just means I have to be more creative, more, more something to do that, so that ability to literally just be tenacious about what you know you have to do, like, and, and not have a pity party about it, it's like, I don't know, it, so to me, I just, I, I've always not, I don't go, I, I'm fairly, <laughs> I have a personality that, I, you know, I go and ask for what I want uh, without, you know, being ashamed of that. And I, but, but the nice part is I actually have, in my mind, a huge advantage of being a woman. Like people have asked me through the years, you know, because I, I hang out with, you know, the most oldest draconian, you know, uh, patriarchal systems known on this planet. Um, which I'm changing, by the way, but uh, <laughs> in terms of that, you have to be able to ask for what you want without, women can actually do it that much better because we actually aren't, you know, a-holes about it, usually, is that you can actually be, you know, very clear and you can also be kind at the same time. You don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to like pound people into the ground and, you know, I'm a hugely collaborative Sound, sounds person. Sounds like another panel I was on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so in turn, you know, I highly encourage people, you know, don't be ashamed of what you want and to, and to go and act, be kind. Don't, don't assume people like guess what you, is in your head. Like tell them. If they, and then they say, no, okay, great, try again. Like don't just take no as, oh, well, I tried and I... I don't, but the other one that I would say that has been a huge success for me is because I am a woman, and that I am deeply collaborative. I will spend an enormous amount of time to help you win too. Like, 
hey, I got to win too. Uh, that's part of the win-win part. <laughs> I'm not dish or like a. <clears throat> uh, but I am super interested in you winning too, and I will spend more time. Even I've sat across the table from people that are absolutely intent on me losing, like um, with unabashed about that as well. And you have to make a choice that I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to join them in trying to see, you know, who's bigger or better. Is I'm going to be who I am, and I'm going to still, in spite of the fact that you are being a jerk, <laughs> to continue to find those win-win solutions. And you will, you will raise more money. You will do more things when you are interested in helping other people succeed as much as you. Win-win. That's a great point. Very good point. Um, Two, two very opposing but very good you know, positions, and they're, they're both equally right, I would say. Um, Sharon, this is gonna, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. <laughs> so as a, as a banker, when a female comes to you and looking to raise capital or she's looking to finance her business, are there any prejudices that still exist in the capital markets to lending or, or giving money to you? I mean, when I first started out, I'll never forget this, I sat in front of a banker who asked me where my male partners were. So now that wasn't that many years ago. <laughs> okay, maybe it was a while ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, so is that does that exist? Do you see any? Do you still see some old barriers that you have to break down? So I would say I'm going to speak for BDC, yep. and I would say at BDC we don't see that, but we are looking for the same things from men that we're looking, or from men and women, right? Yeah. We're looking for you to come prepared, to know what your business is about, to understand your business model, understand your financial statements, you know, how you've gotten to the point where you are today, what the money is going to do to take you forward, and to understand how much you need. Don't kind of come and ask, well, maybe you'll give me this much, um, so I'll ask for that. Understand what you need and ask for that. And then also understand that banks aren't investors. Like, so banks... Banks really want to get paid back. Our return is lower than if we take equity in your company. Our potential return is lower. So we also we have criteria in place and, and, and things that we look at that uh, take into account what we perceive as, first of all, we want to get paid back by the business. But if that doesn't work out, what's, what's the fallback position? And that's, that's very important to all banks, right? We need to understand um, how we're going to get paid back so we can continue to expand um, and lend more money. Interesting. Okay. If I, or yeah. I, I can just add one more uh, comment in terms of, to me, I tell women too, if you want to go raise money or <clears throat> you know, participate in different ways with other companies, be a really great business person who happens to be a woman rather than a woman who happens to be a really great business person. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is show up yeah. as a great business person and happen you know, to be a woman and have all the amazing you know, skills that that brings rather than you know, define yourself by the other way. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that might be easy for us to say, however, for all of us to say, oh, just go to the bank and ask or go to whoever and, and do it and show up with your idea. I think there is a, a lack of confidence that many women face yeah. that really is, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a crisis of confidence. That's what's going on. We have to have more confidence to be able to do things. And, and that actually leads me to my next question around um, being feminine. So I have a question for you around, you know, do you think women can still be feminine and look feminine and still be perceived as leadership material? Do we have to change the way we're actually physically seen in order to be perceived with a strength in leadership? And I know this is a really odd question, but I hear this a lot from young girls who are saying, you know, I don't know how to, like, how do I, I, I want to look like a girl, but I don't feel like I can. So, um... I, I've always believed if you want to wear something girly, go ahead, but that's just me. Like, what do you guys think? Maybe girls. I, or, um, a, I, love, I love being a woman, I love being an engineer, I love being an entrepreneur, and my EA will tell you that, you know, when I speak on panel, she reminds me, don't wear your miniskirt. <laughs> it's like, oh, right, right. Uh, I, I'd have a miniskirt on today if I could. So, I mean, we need to be you know, we're women. We should be women in terms of, of how we dress. But Arlene and I were talking about this earlier. It, it doesn't really matter what you wear if how you feel inside isn't really that great. It's true. Like, you won't feel presidential 
or if you don't, you won't be perceived as presidential if really you don't have that energy inside. I, I can be a president in my yoga pants if, if I need to be. <laughs> You're super comfortable. <laughs> um, it's inside also that is reflecting as much as our, but we need to be, I love being a girl. It's, it's very cool. Could there have been a female Steve Jobs showing up in a black turtleneck and black pants <sighs> every day? Could there have been a female my, Mark Zuckerberg showing up in a T-shirt and jeans every day? Is, is, is that possible? Tell the truth. Come on. I don't think it is. Okay? I'll, I'll put myself out there. I think, I think we would be judged. Right? Or, uh, that's my own opinion again. <laughs> what do you think? I think in corporate life, there's sort of a baseline and probably showing up in your t-shirt and your jeans is not going to get you where you want to be. But showing up in clothes that make you feel comfortable and confident that are professional looking. Yeah. It doesn't have to, yeah. you don't have to be in the black suit and the, and the white blouse, I think, or sort of uniformish looking. It's, um, you can, I think everybody has nice pretty clothes on today. There's lots of women in the room that have nice clothes on today. And um, successful women who have done Yeah, and, and sorry, it's not just your yeah. appearance. I don't yeah. want to make it just about your clothes. I'm just saying, you know, showing up as a woman. I used to have big fights on uh, many times when men would say to me, you can't cry. Can you cry, Vicky? Can you cry in, front, in, in a business setting and still maintain your leadership? This is oh, not absolutely. on our agenda, by the way. I don't know where I'm going. I'm going somewhere. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this died, is the panel okay? on the economic power of women, right? So... Uh, I've I, cried several times at work. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and uh, so do I. But uh, I, I think again, it's creating your the opportunity for a female entrepreneur is to create your own environment where you can be yourself. So we talked about this earlier, right? If you're in an environment where you can't be yourself, you need to change that environment. And so uh, I'm, I won't speak for corporate because I don't speak corporate. I've never worked uh, for anyone else except myself. And uh, I uh, love creating my own culture in my organizations that allows me to thrive. And I think that's the really big opportunity today for women. If something's not working for you, I would say do not lean in more to it. I'd say lean out and go find the place that works right. for you yeah. so you can rock it. Because we need all of you to be rocking it because the world is a mess. And we were not at the table for version 1.0 of this. <laughs> And we need to be at the table for 2.0. I'm old enough that I think I was at the <laughs> <laughs> um, is, Here's a question back to the economy then. Um, is the role of women in business becoming even more important in, as the world evolves? I mean, you talked about collaboration. Technology and collaboration are increasingly becoming day-to-day -to -day tools that we use to help build businesses. And I would say that women are better at collaboration in general than, than men are. So is this, is this, are we entering into an era that is going to enable us to be stronger leaders? Sharon, what do you think? I think so. And, and it's demonstrated women are, are creating businesses and building businesses at a faster rate than men. And we um, can tap into that to, to build on the economy. And the collaboration skills and the technology will help them to, to your point exactly, to work in a way that they want and build the working environment that they need. So if it's between 11 at night and 4 in the morning, they'll find someone else <laughs> somewhere <laughs> online that wants to work at that time too and, and be able to, to get things done. It's, uh, I think definitely that's, uh, those are tools that are skills that women have and, and then tools to enable them to, to be successful moving forward. Yeah, I'd just like to jump in on that with a quick story. So we just announced our five winners for our CEO Radical Generosity Initiative. Those, the way that we do the division of capital is a little bit different. Those five women came together for a weekend and we told them there was $500,000 on the table and it was up to them to divide it up to have the biggest impact and to help grow their businesses together. And there were two rules. One is you can't give it all to one business and you can't divide it up evenly. So imagine if you're, the first thing that most women would do is just go, everyone gets 100 grand, let's go home. <laughs> We're best friends, right? But we, said, we know that that's what you would naturally do, and that's not what we wanted. And so we turned it over to them, and they each presented their number, and the first number they came in with was $865,000. And then they started to try and pick away at that, and they said, that's not going to work. We need another approach. And so somebody said, well, what if you pick the one thing that's the most important that is going to have the biggest impact and the most revenue this year for your business. Go back to the drawing board and come back with it. And they came back and their number was $445,000. So there was another 55K in the pot. And the way that they did that, they said, so one person came in and said, 
if I have $80,000, I'm going to use it to do this, and I'm going to create a million dollars in revenue this year. So that 500K got divided up, and it's going to create $2.5 million in revenue just in year one, and this is a five-year loan. That's what women do when they come together in a room. If it was my three brothers who are maybe watching, um, <laughs> they would beat each other up for one person to win, right? Because we live in a winner-takes-all thing. And, but women don't pick one kid to be successful, right? We work with all of our kids. And I think that when you turn over like, new models for women to decide how to divide up capital to create a bigger impact, I think we have a lot of different thinking than currently exists in the world. The nice thing, too, or sorry, I'll be my soapbox or a teeny bit here. You know, we have been so conditioned to be in a linear, Newtonian, Darwinian world, which is one of the reasons, in my mind, that, you know, women haven't, you know, been as successful sometimes as they want, because this world doesn't necessarily, you know, tap into their natural strengths, as opposed to the world has changed. Those that don't recognize that, well, you're going to recognize it very soon. And the skills of the new world are collaboration integration, intuition. Intuition is one of the greatest gifts that a human being has, greatest gifts. And somehow the business world has sort of said, yeah, we don't really trust that, you can't put it in a formula. Um, really fantastic uh, in terms of you know, personal development, the ability to integrate with each other, creativity and innovation. These are gonna be the skills of the new world. And the really fantastic for you know, the women in this room and watching in, in the rest of the world. We have so many, I mean, everybody, all human beings have these skills, but we have just some natural tendency to move to those skills much easier and, and more naturally. Women are going to be an important, mission critical, vital part of designing our future. And the way that we design it is going to be super freaking cool. <laughs> Wow. Um, so it's, I'm in the process of raising a venture capital fund, and I'm out in the market trying to raise money, and I'm experiencing something very new as a result of that. It, it's true that raising venture capital money is one of the hardest things that a female can do. We know that less than 10% of the venture money goes to women-led businesses, and uh, there are very few fund managers that are female. What, what can we do to influence change in that area? How do we need to show up differently so that people will invest in us? And, and what, the venture world, how do, so there's a female-owned business question, and then there's the question around just raising capital at a fund level. What would you do and suggest that women do differently? So how do we evolve this into the future? So it's not 10% of the money going to women. So I think part of it is, the ask, I mean, and because still a lot of people are afraid to ask, like you pointed out, and um, and I think the broader community is recognizing this is a problem too. I, in preparing for this, I was talking to my VC guys, and they didn't realize until I asked them the question, they didn't realize what small percentage of funding went to women, so it was really sort of eye-opening for them. And um, so there are, we're, we're looking as an organization now at, at investing in a fund that will just support uh, women women-led ventures. Um, I, someone emailed me something today. Apparently in the US now there's five. Five in all of the VC worlds that uh, are really focused on women. So definitely um, there needs to be a mind shift in, and, and we'll have to help push it along because I don't think it'll necessarily go there quickly because you know, still that is especially a world of there's, there's a winner um, and a loser potentially. So <laughs> to, to move that along so that uh, everyone is thinking about the ability and, and looking at the stats because the companies that have, that have senior leadership, they do better. They're more likely to be successful. They, they outperform the all-male companies. So it, getting people to, to take the actual facts that are in front of them and, and internalize them a little bit takes a while. There's some inertia. And yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting point because I find it, it's contradictory and, I, and I, there's part of me, I, I don't believe in quotas. I never have believed in quotas. I believe in meritocracy. I think what you bring to the table, if you deserve to get it, you should get it. Um, so I worry that um, if we start to have these relationships that this is specifically only for women, this, this fund is only for women, um, that we are actually in, in, 
enabling the very issue we're trying to talk about today and debate. So uh, do you guys feel like it should be, you know, dollars attached to females? Should it be dollars attached to a specific type of business? Should it be that we, we, we ensure that the numbers are raised from 10% up and, and whatever that is? Like, and I'm not suggesting it's right or wrong. I'm just asking, it feels to me like it's a bit more of a quota system than it is about a merit system. And that's, that's what the shift, I think, has to be. I don't know, what do you, what do well, you think? So I, yeah, I can jump right in there because we've just created something that's female specific. Uh, and there's a reason why. I mean, I, uh, eventually we would, uh, CEO could invest in he EOs. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Um, but for now, uh, I think it's, it's really, women are dramatically underfinanced. Uh, and I think one of the first starting points, I look at this with a 20 year lens. Like I think it takes a long time to change what we're talking about because it's culture change. Underneath it all, there's a bias that we all have, whether or not we're aware of it, of how we treat men and women differently. So um, I think setting up funds that support women, uh, to me, really matters. And it's the beginning of this, we'll, we will uh, begin to start supporting women. And you know, to your point about the data, we've had this data for a long time. If we invested in women to the same degree as men, we would create six million jobs in the next five years in North America alone. We've had this data. We have the data that women are more capital efficient. We have the data that women get to profitability more quickly and still it's not really changing behavior. So uh, for me, there's, there's, there are underlying deeper issues here that we need to kind of get at. And for me, I think it starts with, uh, we need to support each other first. We, the largest wealth transfer in history is happening right now, and women are going to inherit 75% of that wealth. We have wealth. We make 80% of purchasing decisions. We've got the buying power. If we decide to start supporting each other, everything changes. And I know I see nodding heads like we know that we do this, but we don't really know the power we have. We have huge power if we come together to support each other. Um, I will give a slightly different answer just to keep uh, things interesting in that. <laughs> I'm a huge fan, keep in mind, these are always my opinions, they didn't make them right or wrong, is that um, I'm not as interested in trying to play a game better. I really, really like new games. Uh, I think they're funner, I think they're more exciting uh, to do that. So I also joke that I have to live till I'm about 140 to execute all the ideas in my head. And one of the things that uh, I'm going to be changing in, in my future incarnations is uh, sort of long some of these lines is we need to change the system to which we allocate money. Not necessarily who we give it to, but way that we assess economics. The way that we assess economics is bonkers. Um, it is super linear. We take you know, one cause, one effect, and we have short term. We, we've driven our economies into these crazy booms and busts because we have short term thinking. We, we use like the minuscule, we use payouts and like just simple thinking that is not, we don't include, you know, sorry, my soapbox for clean energy in terms of if we included all the costs of pollution, I mean, polluting is the cheapest thing to do <laughs> if you don't include all the other economic factors. We need to change how we think of looking at economics, looking at long term versus short term. We need to look at things as a system rather than you know, a sequence of events. We need to change our thinking of how and where we are putting money and how we're allocating that and how we use the criteria to judge whether people get it or not, that the system needs to change, not necessarily, and, and as well, I'm. I'm a proponent of, of helping women specifically, and I'm also a proponent, you know, I was at a large behemoth, um, you know, major corporation, and I saw them doing, they did it, you know, well-intentioned of putting certain women, you know, in management positions, but it literally did a massive disservice because they would then promote women that had no business being in those positions. And so they didn't get respect. And then it just, it defeats also some of the, so it can have, you know, both a positive and a negative. We just need to, there's no, everything has a good and a bad. Technology, when we invented fire, it gave us light and heat, and it also burned down our houses. I mean, everything, you know, has good and bad, and we need to recognize that, and we need to shift our consciousness to, you know, bring out all the good things about all the different things, right? 
Awesome. I mean, I, I certainly have uh, an opinion. I, I, I'm, I won't go there. Um, so, because <laughs> I, we have two questions, we have three questions that came from the floor that are very interesting questions. We only have 10 minutes left, so I need your answers to be a little bit uh, short if you can. Um, so the first one, based on what we just said, because I think this actually leads right into this question. Do you consider yourself feminist? And if not, why? Justin Trudeau does, so why do we have trouble doing so? That's the question. Do you consider yourself a feminist? And if not, why? Uh, I will start. <laughs> <laughs> You're seeing the trend here, aren't you? <laughs> um, I, I do not consider myself a feminist in terms of I love being a woman and who I am, but I'm a big believer, as Arlene is, in, in meritocracy. I'm a big believer that all people are amazing and extraordinary, and that we need to assume that people are amazing and extraordinary, no matter, I, I, it is dismaying the conversations of racism, and we've separated society in every unhealthy way we could possibly imagine. Race, religion, gender, politics. In my industry, you're either a crazy tree hugger or a greedy capitalist. Those are your two options. <laughs> Like seriously, like I don't care what problem you're trying to solve, if we just get into these super simple labels, we're missing like this enormous amount of permutations and combinations of different solutions by creating these labels and these, they're just not helpful. Okay, so your answer is no. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna move over to Vicky. Thank you. No, I, mean, I, I agree, I totally agree with everything you just said and I don't know what has, anyway, labels. I don't know, what does a feminist mean to people here? Really? Like. What does it mean? I don't know what a feminist means. I would call myself a feminist. Uh, I'm a strong woman who cares about helping everyone thrive and do the best they can do in this world. I'm a feminist. So you're a feminist, Sharon? It's not a label I think about very often, to be perfectly honest. Again, I want to help people be successful. I think in order to be the most successful, we need a mix of lots of diversity, not just men, women, lots of different kinds of diversity and opinions at the table. So okay. whatever that classifies us. <laughs> All right. Um, there's, there's a couple more questions, but let's, let's, there's, there was one that I thought was, was super interesting um, because of what's going on in the United States. And of course, the United States has impact on us. So what positive results do you expect if the next US president is a woman? And God help us if it's not. <laughs> if it's Trump, I am. I am going to go on public record, whatever that is, to say, God help us if Trump gets in. Because I, and I mean that sincerely because of all of the bigotry and racism that he represents. But you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that Hillary Clinton is the, the best candidate, but she might be the best of two evils. That's a different point. So. Uh, I, I, I'm with you, God forbid. <laughs> um, he, he represents everything that is troubling about America yeah. uh, in terms of that. So. Uh, I hope so what would you expect from Hillary if she gets in? I hope that Hillary is going to do the things that I think are the positive aspects of a woman being there is in bringing people together. Okay, Vicky? Yeah, I mean, I, it would be amazing to have a female president so that young girls who are growing up realize that that's a job that they can aspire to as well. I mean, I think a lot of uh, having role models out there that you can see, um, having more women on the covers of magazines, having more women leaders out there, a lot of the storytelling and the, and the media presence of women, I think, will do a lot to help shift us into a better direction. Okay. Yeah, well, I think, yeah. Having a female leader, she has a lot more ideas that I think are collaborative, inclusive, that are generally better for society as a whole than, yes, any of the alternatives. <laughs> Yet she's judged on her pantsuits and her hair. So let's yeah. move off of that. So can each panelist share their definition of business success and personal success? So quickly, what is personal success and business success for you? Your definition. I think um, finding a balance that works for you. So me right now, I have young kids, so um, it's really important to me that um, I have take the time to make sure that they're getting the things that they need to be successful, and also um, when I come to work then to, to give of myself to my team to try to help them be successful and, and figure out what they need to, um, to further their careers and, and to, to be successful in what they're going to do every day. So you're, you're defining your success through your children being happy and healthy and your yeah, pro and professional And occasionally peers. finding some time for myself. Yeah, in <laughs> yeah. between. Yeah. Yeah. Vicky, personal, uh, professional. So 
personal for me is is really to work on being compassionate. I mean, I uh, I think it's it's pretty easy to say you made it, so why can't everyone else make it? Uh, but I think it's really important to recognize that everybody comes from a different place. They see the world a little differently than you do. They have different struggles. Uh, so to remember that when I'm in the world. Uh, and then the other thing is, as a mentor, which I love to be a mentor, um, I love asking people what is success for them before I even give them advice. Because there's so much assumption out there that the only thing that matters is growth uh, and you know working all the time. And so... For me, it's success on your own terms. And so from a business perspective, for me, uh, I want to have the biggest possible impact. Uh, and for me, that's capital. It's financially and also socially. Um, super quickly, oddly for me, they're no two different. Bus I don't have a business self and a personal self. They're, I just have me. There's they're no separation in that. And they're both the same. Is that I get up every morning and I want to show up 100% with the gifts and the talents that I've been given, because frankly, I find it disrespects the talents that I've been given in this lifetime if I don't. And whatever that, if my 100% isn't good enough for somebody, I can't do anything with that. All I know is at the end of the day, I know I showed up 100% and I did everything that I could. I want to leave this earth knowing I've done everything that I can to make it a better place because I was here rather than if I was, you know, just completely irrelevant. That, that to me, right? Which I think is an awesome way to, to end because we started off talking about that the biggest barrier to ourselves is us. That if we don't have confidence and we don't believe that we can and we don't recognize the skills and talents that we've been given, that we end up becoming our own worst enemy. So I would say, for me, success is exactly that. It's believing in who you are and being unafraid of success whatever that is, because we can be afraid to be good and big and strong. And if we get in our own way, we will never succeed, ever. So when you get up in the morning, remember that you woke up this morning in the best city and the best country in the world, that you've been given talents that only you have, that there is nothing stopping you from a religious, feminine, um, uh, <laughs> Any, there's nothing stopping you. You can say what you want, you can wear what you want, you can do what you want, you get food to eat, you have water to drink, you have this country to do it in. And that in and of itself is what women need to remember, that we have to take that forward and own this country in a way that represents, not just here but in the world stage. So I, I'm encouraged by everything I've heard today. Thank you for sharing all of your wisdom. It was awesome and I appreciate it. Thank you. Arlene, my gosh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Willa Black, and I'm a proud director of, of the Canadian Club. Uh, Vicki, Sharon, Suzanne, and Arlene, on behalf of the Canadian Club, I'd like to thank you for proving why women entrepreneurs are a force to be reckoned with. Through your ingenuity, vision, and dedication, you have each made your mark in the business world and your living examples to Vicky's point of leaders that have changed the process and kept the women. And more than that, you're taking the time to inspire other business leaders and to mentor those who dream big of being their own bosses. You're paving the way so that more women can boldly and confidently launch companies of their own by being themselves. And to our moderator, Arlene, whether in front of the camera or behind the scenes, we appreciate your ability to captivate audiences like you did today. Thank you, Arlene. So to you all, thank you. And we wish you well in your quest to break a little glass. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'd like to echo uh, Willa's comments and just very briefly on behalf of the club, uh, thank you very much. Truly, we have fulfilled our mission. We feel educated, we feel inspired, and we feel confident that version 2.0, whether it's in Canada or globally, is going to be much better thanks to your leadership and your continued role in making sure that women entrepreneurs have their active and rightful role in helping to grow our, business, our economy and our society. On that note, I would like to thank you all for joining us. I would like to take a moment again to thank our sponsors. Uh, in particular, a thank you to BDC, 
to Cisco, to RBC, and Scotiabank for making today's luncheon possible and being able to bring us all together. On that note, again, thank you for joining us. Have a great afternoon. This meeting is now adjourned.